10 Absolutely Underrated Western Horror Movies You Dig Up and Watch What comes to mind when you hear the words Western films? Well, it could be anything from Clint Eastwood to broad-brimmed and high-crowned Stetson hats, neckerchief bandanas, cowboy boots, and a lot of gunslinging. All of this gets more entertaining when someone blends the horror genre with it. So you see, we can have any kind of monsters like vampires, werewolves, zombies, huge ugly human-eating worms, or cannibalistic tribesmen and cursed ghost towns. These films have a certain charisma around their characters, yet they don't refrain from being scary or slow-burning. In this video, we will bring you the highly overlooked and underrated Western horror films that definitely need some digging up and being watched. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Bone Tomahawk, 2015 at the dusk of the 19th century, Purvis and Buddy make a living snatching and robbing travelers in what is now the border between New Mexico and Texas. They encounter a Native American burial site, and soon Buddy is killed while Purvis escapes to the small town of Bright Hope. Unbeknownst to Purvis, he brought a tribe of cannibals into the town, and now they've abducted Purvis along with a medical assistant named Samantha and the town deputy Nick. Sheriff Franklin Hunt forms up a posse to hunt down the cannibal tribesmen and retrieve the abductees who know no mercy. Writer and director S. Craig Zoller catapults the viewer into an atmosphere that's fiercely Western and visually horrific. At 132 minutes, the film might feel overindulgent, but a fantastic cast led by veteran Kurt Russell makes the whole experience enjoyable yet haunting. It is a staple for a Western film to have the main hero supported by a charismatic cast. In Bone Tomahawk, Franklin Hunt is complimented by Patrick Wilson, who plays Arthur. It's one thing to make a Western, and it's totally another when you throw raw candy cannibalism into the recipe. <laughs> Bone Tomahawk is a slow burn, but when it picks up speed, it gets gruesome. Interestingly, the cave that's shown in the final act of the film is the same cave where Tony Stark built the first Iron Man suit. <laughs> Ravenous, 1999. John Boyd, a second lieutenant in the United States Army, captures a Mexican command post, but he achieved this feat by a cowardly act of playing dead. Outraged by this, General Slauson transfers him to a remote military outpost named Fort Spencer in the Sierra Nevada, where the commanding officer, Colonel Hart Boyd, finds himself amongst a bunch of bumbling misfits in the name of soldiers. Soon enough, a stranger named Colcown arrives at the fort and describes his harrowing experiences. His wagon got lost in the mountains and his colleagues were stranded for almost three months. Struck by starvation, they resorted to cannibalism. Immediately after, a search party is formed to rescue the survivors, but a Native American named George tells the men about the Wendigo myth that whenever a person eats another, they become addicted to more human flesh. The soldiers reach a cave and find dead remains and human skeletons. However, it seems that they themselves will have to indulge in the horrific act of cannibalism to survive. The film stars noted actors like Guy Pearce, Robert Carlyle, and David Arquette. It is loosely based on and inspired by the story of the Donner Party, when a group of Americans got stuck in the snowy mountains of Sierra Nevada. When supplies ran out, they resorted to cannibalism and ate anyone who succumbed to the harsh cold or disease. Alfred Packer, or the infamous Colorado Cannibal, also serves as a mild inspiration. Despite being about a grim subject like anthropophagy, director Antonia Bird gave Ravenous a darkly humorous tone that almost makes it a black comedy. Ravenous contains elements of vampirism and cannibalism, but never relies too heavily on either one, and this fine balance makes it a masterpiece in its own right. That being said, there's all kinds of messed up things in the film, and so we suggest you don't watch this one while having dinner. <laughs> Near Dark, 1987 One night, just before the sun would come up, young Caleb Colton meets a beautiful drifter named May and thinks it is no harm to give her a lift. Just as she's about to leave, he asks her for a kiss, but May gives him more than that and bites him before fleeing. Later that day, sunlight hurts Caleb and his skin begins to smoke and burn. He now realizes what the bite meant. Sarah and Loy Colton, Caleb's sister and father, witness him getting abducted by a group of people. 
The group is actually May's family, and is led by a centuries-old vampire named Jesse. Everyone in the band wants Caleb dead, but May saves him by telling the others that she's already converted him. Caleb will now need to earn the trust of the group by learning to hunt and kill. May initially helps him because Caleb fails to digest the idea of hunting humans, even though he can very well digest human blood. The two of them fall in love, but when Sarah and Loy show up, he will have to choose between the love of life and his beloved family. Just you let them go. It's my family. Near Dark is a very clever film because it conveniently avoids most cliches that come with the vampire genre. There's no slaughtering of innocent virgin girls, no Van Helsing with a crossbow, no one turns into flying creatures, and the group has a real struggle of finding prey whilst evading the cops. I mean, come on, you cannot go on killing people and remain unnoticed. The film is like a classic burger in a new sauce. Mine. Interestingly enough, this modern take on blood-sucking creatures never mentions the term vampire even once. Some are also of the opinion that this was director Catherine Bigelow's attempt to depict rampant drug addiction from a different angle, and it is probably this fact that the film feels real and psychologically painful. Indeed, Near Dark has elements like love, family, righteousness, and of course, sexual desires. <laughs> The Burrowers, 2008. In 1879, a family living in the outskirts of civilization was abducted mysteriously. As was common back in the day, the needle of suspicion initially pointed towards the indigenous people. A posse consisting of two battle-weary men, a man desperate to find his love, and a hot-blooded teenager was formed. As the men started their arduous journey to bring the family back home safely, they realized that the forces that abducted the group were not human. It's actually a species that used to thrive on American bison, but once the settlers killed them all, these animals started hunting humans. The only people who know how to deal with these beasts belong to a native tribe named Ute, but even their numbers are dwindling because of the new settlers. The film is one of the best efforts at making a horror western. It's set in the wild, wild west, it has elements of socio-political issues prevalent in that part of history, and works just fine as a refreshed version of the monster film. The depiction of the monsters as spider-legged flesh-eaters is good, but the VFX used to show them move could have been better. Having said that, it's a piece of sweet cake to the gorehounds looking for monsters who bury their victims alive and wait for the decomposition to start before the devouring begins. Furthermore, the plot is not dodgy, and the acting of Clancy Brown as John Clay and David Busey as Young Bluecoat are on par with the acting of the cast of Bone Tomahawk. Writer and director J.T. Petty did a great job and gave a gripping film, but we have to agree that the screenplay and VFX could have been better. After 600 years, how's that dick working? Pretty good? Huh? Vampires, 1998. As a child, Jack Crow lost his parents to vampires, and he pledged eternal revenge. As a grown-up, he works as a vampire hunter, and is funded by the Vatican itself. Jack and his team are skilled vampire slayers, and their latest assignment is a house full of the bloodsuckers. Through a coordinated attack tactic, Jack's team managed to kill nine vampires, but they fail to find the Elder One. Although they celebrate their victory with alcohol and women, Crow worries about the leader. His fears become a reality when the powerful Valak arrives and massacres the drunk vampire slayers and bites a woman named Katrina. Jack flees the spot with Katrina and his trusted lieutenant Montoya. Jack reports the incident to Cardinal Alba, who tells him that Valak is the first ever vampire who seeks an ancient relic that could give him the power to walk the face of the earth even under sunlight. Jack must use whatever resources he has left to fight this ancient being. Vampires has the reputation of having a difficult production. Legendary director John Carpenter was considering retirement after a string of box office failures, but this film's script intrigued him. Unfortunately, the executives decided to cut the film's budget by two-thirds, and Carpenter had to do significant rewrites. Nevertheless, the auteur used whatever resources he had and gave us a gory, violent, crude, and exciting film. The tension builds furthermore in the last 35 minutes when things become sexy and scary. Carpenter's expertise and knowledge as a filmmaker make the 
protagonist and antagonist equally powerful and charismatic. James Woods as John Crow and Thomas Ian Griffith as John Valick are top-notch, but due credit must also be given to the performances of Daniel Baldwin and Cheryl Lee. The film put John Carpenter back on the map of horror filmmakers, and Vampires tells that Carpenter can do wonders with whatever he puts his hands on, and this time it was a Western horror. Something happened. <laughs> Dead Birds, 2004 during the American Civil War of 1861, a group of Confederate outlaws rob a bank. The posse is headed by William and consists of Sam, Clyde, Joseph, Todd, and Annabelle. They steal gold and seek to flee into Mexico, but nightfall and a thunderstorm force them to take refuge in a barn near an abandoned plantation. As they cross the plantation, they come across a scarecrow that looks like a crucified human being. The group soon learns that the seemingly abandoned farmhouse is not entirely empty. Many years ago, it was owned by a farmer who had a loving wife and two beautiful children. The wife's death left the man crazy, and he resorted to native black magic to revive her. He sacrificed his children, the slaves, and any living person in and around his house. This grave and diabolical act didn't bring her back. It instead transformed the victims into evil entities who would kill anyone who entered the house. When the villagers learned about this, they crucified the man on his own plantation. The evil spirit soon started taking over William and his followers. As the night grows darker, it brings further horrors. Will they survive? My parents used to lie together in this bed. This is Director Alex Turner and writer Simon Barrett definitely know how to make a Western horror. The sheer topography of the farmhouse, with no specific roads or paths leading to it, tells us that something is entirely wrong, that something sinister is brewing in that house and plantation. Apart from a few minor SFX and VFX flaws, the film packs a bundle of chilling scenes. Each of the characters experiences a different kind of demonic entity, and we couldn't help but get strong vibes of H.P. Lovecraft in all the necromancy that the the film projects. Michael Shannon as Clyde and Nikki Acox as Annabelle are the real show stealers, but Henry Thomas and others have done a great job as well. All things said, this film is a great one-time watch if you're looking for a quirky western horror, so hunt it and watch it. <laughs> Ghost Town, 1988 Kate left her fiancé at the altar and is now driving alone on a highway near Riverton, Arizona. She hears a mysterious noise of horses galloping along with her car. Intrigued by this event, she pulls over but finds no one. Soon, a dust cloud engulfs her and she disappears. Sheriff Langley finds her abandoned vehicle and tries to investigate, but before he can do anything, his car is shot at by a man on a horse. The car explodes and he is forced to travel on foot. Langley finds an abandoned ghost town and spends the night in one of the buildings there. The next day, he wakes up to several apparitions who seem to be the natives of the town. Meanwhile, a zombie-like man named Devlin has abducted Kate. Devlin keeps the wandering spirits terrified and also controls them because of a pact that he made with the devil. Will Langley survive and save Kate? Despite good performances and efficient cinematography, Ghost Town is haunted by the ghosts of a predictable story. The script seems dodgy at times, but the film feels visually rich. It was probably the first Western film with a zombie angle and also had elements of the supernatural. This fresh twist of the zombie film subgenre intrigued viewers and made it a rather fun watch. The film is based on a story by David Schmuller, in which a man tries to relieve a ghost town from an age-old curse. Frank Luz as Langley, Catherine Hickland as Kate, and Jimmy F. Skaggs as Devlin are potentially the greatest strengths of the film, which otherwise would have fallen flat on its face. Having said that, Ghost Town is an eerie movie that needed a more refined touch, but it doesn't deserve to be overlooked. High Plains Drifter, 1973 The people of the secluded mining town of Lago in Inyo County, California live with a dark secret. Three violent outlaws are soon to be released from prison, and they're expected to hit the town with all their rage and finish some unfinished business. However, a strange drifter rides into the town from the heat of the desert. The gunslinging stranger is requested by the town's head to stay and protect them for a desired price. However, the townsfolk soon doubt this decision and wonder if 
seeking his help is the right thing to do. As the three outlaws approach the town, they're shocked to see that the village has changed and is guarded by a new protector, who will rid the town of its corruption with his own brand of justice. Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter is not essentially a horror movie, but the famous actor's directorial skills paint the atmosphere with supernatural colors. Firstly, he had the entire town of Lago built from scratch for the film. The location offered different colors throughout the day, and Eastwood used idiosyncratic photography, eerie music, and dream sequences to bring out the supernatural element. Who are you? Naturally, High Plains Drifter is heavily influenced by the directorial style of Sergio Leone. Clint Eastwood did wonderfully as an actor and director, but back in 1973, the film was accused of being overtly violent and putting the Old West in a rather bad light. The film is a gothic horror story, a revenge thriller, but it packs humor and staple Western cliches. A treat to the eye and mind, we'd say. Undead or Alive, 2007. Local cowboy Luke plans to marry a saloon girl, and when he visits to propose to her, he finds her having sex with an army deserter Elmer Winslow. Well, Luke's princess is a prostitute. The two men get into a fight and the corrupt Sheriff Claypool arrests them and steals the $500 that Elmer had on him. They manage to escape and on their way out steal all of the sheriff's money. Naturally, he is left aghast and forms a posse to hunt the two men. Luke and Elmer are attacked by a girl named Sue who claims to be the niece of Geronimo, the great leader of the Apache tribe. She is seeking revenge for the murder of her uncle and tells Luke and Elmer about the curse of Geronimo that turns white men into zombies, which has happened to the sheriff and his men. The horror element of the film is mild and uneven, but what makes Undead or Alive a watchable film is its humor. While it doesn't reach the level of other great horror comedies like Zombieland, it does manage to generate constant laughter. The gore is fairly decent, with arms, legs, heads, and even penises getting ripped off by some angry Wild West zombies. While Chris Catton as Luke, James Denton as Elmer, and Navy Rawat as Sue give good performances, the star of the show remains Matt Besser as Claypool. No matter what, you'll have a great time watching this one. And a little heads up, the flick has a few cannibalistic undertones. What do you think, Leah? Eyes of Fire 1983. In the year 1750, a group of pioneers narrowly escape an attack because their head preacher Will Smythe is accused of living a life of adultery. The group consists of men and women of all ages and a girl named Leah who has supernatural powers. They travel far away from their hometown and into the wilderness of a valley, but they don't realize that the place holds a demonic presence. While they have to survive this evil entity, they're also in mortal danger of attacks by tribes of violent Native Americans. In a bid to save themselves from the Shawnee Indians, they enter a place that the Shawnee are scared to go because of various superstitions. But the individuals soon learn that these superstitions are more than a myth. Eyes of Fire is a great example of a slow burner. The first half takes its time to build the complex relationship that the characters share. The viewer is introduced to the seclusion and isolation that engulfs Will Smythe and his group of men. It's a practical thing to do because it only makes the viewer more involved with the story. The second half offers a more action-packed sequence of events, with exploding children, haunting white spirits, trees growing strange faces on their barks, and above all, a poltergeist on the loose. The color scheme used is almost psychedelic and may digress the viewer from what's actually happening in the film. It's essentially a movie with a deep sense of paranoia and fear from director Avery Krauts. Dennis Lipscomb and Guy Boyd do most of the heavy lifting on the acting front. Do watch out for the faces on tree scenes as they're particularly weird yet eerie. If you guys enjoyed this video, give us a like, subscribe, and press that bell icon that will help you get notifications. We upload an awesome video every day. Have an amazing day ahead and stay safe.